2010, um, I was working on a project, a very famous project called Fort Terranova. I built a $20 million underground shelter in Northwest Georgia. It's about the size of three Walmarts all on the ground. It's called Fort Terranova. You can look it up. It's on the History Channel. It's on the History Channel. They featured me on an episode called uh, Countdown to Apocalypse, and it was the Nostradamus episode. And that was back in 2012 when it finally aired. It was filmed before then. But I was building this shelter, uh, this massive shelter, because I started researching the procession of the equinoxes, because I'm an amateur astronomer. And through the research, I realized that procession was speeding up. And I was like, wow, why would procession speed up? I mean, you know, not by a lot, but when you're racing in a race, if you come in two seconds ahead of somebody, that's a massive amount of time in a race, in a foot race, right? So the procession is speeding up by two or 3,000 years. That's a massive difference. What could cause that? So I started theorizing about it. I started saying, the only way the procession can speed up means our sun is probably orbiting something for breakaway speed. That would cause it to speed up and then it would break that, it would break that orbit that it would need to take. And then it would slow down again. Then we would build a break with like, you know, gravitational assist type stuff and technology. We talk about, you know, using gravitational assist to get satellites out to deep space. So I started looking into that and I found an old documentary uh, that talked about Nemesis and it talked about uh, it was the golden year. <clears throat> and um, James Earl Jones was narrating it. And it was talking about the possibility that we're living in a binary solar system. This before any new science and everything ever came out about the brown dwarf and all this other stuff. So I started thinking about this and I started uh, learning about the potential orbital rates. And I started realizing that as this object came closer to our sun, there were more geological disasters being recorded in ancient texts on the planet. And I was like, hmm, this is pretty interesting. We could be headed for a geological disaster in a couple hundred years. What can I do about it? The only thing I could think of was to build an underground shelter so that my kids' kids or whatever, or my kids, you know, even if myself, if it came early, if I was off, could survive it. So I started working on building, or the concept of building an underground shelter. I was going to use containers, shipping containers. And a friend of mine who had, was, uh, worked at the military at a very high level with TS clearance, he told me, um, you don't want to do uh, shipping containers because they have 90 degree angles and underground as Earth ships, those corners will crack and then radon gases can come in and snuff you family out. It'll be all over. He said, also, you probably don't want to do something where it's just you solo because you only have a certain uh, limited amount of skills. Um, you probably want to do something with a small community so that everybody can ship in. I was like, wow, that's a great point. So I started researching and he was like, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to give you the contact that we use when I work for Oliver North, you know who that is, uh, the U.S. military, the company we use to build the shelters for the United States military that he lived in. Uh, and in there, they even had 3D printers back then. They would build an entire Jeep, he said. Everything you needed to drive the Jeep out was built on a machine in that shelter. He gave me the number to Radius Engineering, and I contacted them and I told them what my concept and idea was. And the guy hopped on a plane with a CFO and flew to my house the next day in Florida. So we struck a deal, we worked out a, a deal and um, started working on Fort Terranova, which means, uh, you know, Fort is a, it's a fort and uh, Terra means Earth and Nova. Uh, it's like, you know, supernova in case of a, a, a disaster which I thought potentially could be caused by the sun gravitationally and maybe even through a, a coronal mass ejection. So that's why I named it Fort Terranova. And uh, the, it's got an underground uh, uh, river flowing there. Uh, this is why I picked that spot. Did a lot of research. Had to be 700 feet above sea level, 600 miles away from the coastline. It had to be, uh, it couldn't be downwind from any volcanic activity. Uh, it had to be uh, 300 miles away from any nuclear power plants. Uh, you had to test for radon gas and various other dangerous gases. Um, uh, contamination tests were done. Uh, the book for that shelter, which we call the Bible, is about this thick, and it cost 20000 just to get all the science to create that book. And uh, that book covers every aspect of the shelter, including every nut, every rivet, every bolt, all, all uh, you know, criteria for living there, the type of clothing, the type of material it needs that you can actually wear and you can't wear in reasonable way, for ventilation and so forth. If a person dies, what the actual procedure is to remove the body, uh, you know, the storage containers, how to eat the food and put
put the waste back into the same historic uh, containment spot. And I don't know if it was because of this research that I was doing, but I was in my house one day after a long day of crazy work on this project, and I sat down on my couch to watch ESPN Sport Update, um, and the whole room turned lavender. And so I was like, wow, what in the hell? So I thought my kids were playing a trick on me. I thought my boys were back then. You know, I still had kids living in the house and everything. I turned over my left shoulder. Nobody was there. I was like, wow. When I turned back around, right in my face, two gray aliens. Mm. Gray aliens in my face. Real as day. Real as you sitting right there. They were there. I was sitting in a chair, uh, a, a, you know, a sofa couch. And sitting in them, you know, so from my height, based on how tall they were, because they were standing straight up, they couldn't have been no more than four and a half feet max. They, I couldn't tell if those were really eyes or goggles. Um, that part I couldn't tell. But they did have slits in there for ears, uh, little tiny dots for nose, and a slit for a mouth that never opened or never moved. And they had on this weird body jumpsuit. Um, but the thing that happens is they, whatever they did, started making my brain shake. They didn't communicate with me. They didn't tell me anything like verbally that I could understand. But my, literally, my head started shaking in my skull. I started trying to scream, and no sound was coming out. Like my sound was muted, and um, it was a traumatizing experience. Um, I ran around the house. Nobody heard the sort of thing. When they left, they didn't really walk like a normal person walks. They kind of have this bounce to them. It almost looked like a like a puppeteer, you know? It wasn't like a walk. Why? I have no idea. I, don't, I can't even tell you what it was. But what did happen uh, is it was the, the straw broke the camel's back <laughs> in that relationship ending. I didn't make any money because I didn't tell anybody about it um, and um, for many years. And it horrified and terrified my kids. Um, and me. And me, and still to this day, time time I get shakes about thinking about it. It wasn't a pleasant experience. The other thing that did come out of it, I think, was the next day, the phrase, the words, worldwide telescope was on my mind over and over and over again, thousands of times, to the point where it became annoying. So I went to my computer and I went on insight.com. Back then, Google was, you know, they were good, but it was still, I was still going on insight.com. It was a search engine. And I typed in Worldwide Telescope, and the first search result was WorldwideTelescope.org. And I literally almost fell out of my chair. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? And back then, you had to download it. Now you have a choice. You can download it or you can just load it. It's a software program, but it runs on HTML5 now, so you don't have to install any software if you don't want to. I installed the software. I opened it up, and it's all the space probe data, every space mission every probe that ever went out from Earth in that one website. All the data. I mean, all of <laughs> I was like, wow. And the first thing I saw was uh, uh, Mars panoramas. So I said, okay, Mars panoramas. Then I saw Opportunity Rover. I said, okay, Opportunity Rover. And then it takes you in like you're looking through the rover, the Opportunity Rover's eyes. Because what they've done is the Opportunity Grove is consistently taking these images on a consistent pan as it moves around. So all those images become what they call gigapans. So they take those images and they stitch them together and you have the range and you have the panning built in to these three-dimensional imagery and it gives you the effect as if you're actually in the role for controlling it, even though it's really stitched images. It's a really amazing thing. It's open to the general population, general public. There's no money, no fee involved in this. It, uh, it's just your taxes already paid for this stuff. Every person just doesn't even know it exists. So um, as I look on these Mars panoramas, I start seeing right away anomalies, things that look out of place. And I'll show you some of those today. They didn't belong there. And I was trying to figure out why some of these things looked Egyptian. Why did they look Egyptian? That was the big question. Um, and that sent me down a whole other rabbit hole because now I started going, wow, wait a minute. Megalithic structures on Earth, megalithic structures on Mars, Egyptian motif type statues on Mars, pyramids on Mars, on, on a server that contains all this information open to the general population from space probe data. So I said, there only has to be one architect. There's only one architect, and I got to find out who this is. That's the on my quest to find Thoth the Atlantean. <laughs> 
That's how I, that's what sent me on the quest. I started researching all the ancient texts to find out if there was any account of Mars, and I found it in the Sumerian tablets. That's how I started going to the Sumerians and going to the Numa the Seventh Epic of the Creation, the Adra Esk Epic, the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, all these different ancient writings uh, from the Sumerians. And uh, that led me into the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, Indian Vedas, that led me into uh, the, you know, uh, all the ancient scriptures and, and stuff, the, you know, Nakamadi scripts and all this stuff. And eventually, and I ended up at the Emerald Tablets. And that's when I said, wow, bingo, I found it. I found the architect. This was the architect, the master architect that laid down the floor plan for these types of structures to be built, not only around the entire planet Earth, as he said, he ordered people to do, but also throughout the entire solar system, and maybe even beyond. So that's how I, you know, that's how I came across. So if anything that I got out of that experience was it sent me down the rabbit hole into finding or searching for space anomalies. I then later formed the United Family of Anomaly Hunters, which uh, their press release went global. And our search for extraterrestrial life, uh, not only on Earth, but also in our solar system, based off of official space probe data from multiple space agencies. And to date, we've downloaded over a million images from the space agencies, and we've now documented over 58,000 anomalies uh, things that don't belong on these particular planets and moons in our solar system. We've covered Venus, uh, Venus, Mercury, uh, Mars, Ceres, C E R E S, which is the planet just outside of Mars that hardly anybody knows even exists. There's a lot of anomalies on that planet. Uh, the moon Titan, the moon Triton, the moon Ganymede, the moon Io, the moon Iapetus, and we've documented some amazing stuff that prove, in my personal opinion, that there was an advanced Atlantean civilization that was interplanetary, interacting in our solar system in ancient times, and still evidence that they're around till this very day, or at least the civilizations that they kick-started are still around. The Huygens probe space data uh, that we've analyzed is absolutely mind-shattering. It should be on every TV channel in the world 24-7 instead of watching these poly tricks. It should be that. The Huygens probe, which landed on... Um, the moon Titan, which is the same exact size of the Earth, and it's got solid land and lakes and everything else. On its descent video, which is broadcast back to Earth, thankfully, show artificial structures on the, on the hillside, on a mountainside or a hillside. I can't go to a mountain or a hill. Going all the way up, though, and what looks to be what we would call in our eyes a satellite type of dish or a dish that receives its information. Not saying that's what it is, but saying that's what it looks like. And pyramids. What are pyramids doing on Titan? So it's an amazing, you know, it just it just led me down this rabbit hole of information and to research that transformed my life in a whole nother way and uh, took me down another research path that I didn't even anticipate. And you know, here I am today now talking about a lot of these ancient civilizations, which was kind of really kickstarted from that experience, you know, that I had. Why it happened to me? Why they came? Did they were they the ones that made me think about Worldwide Telescope? I just don't know. I can just tell you what happened, the chain of events that happened along that path that led me to that, you know, and uh yeah, amazing experience. It's you know, just an amazing experience. So yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird life, it's a weird world, you know. And uh oh look, there goes uh, somebody here. Every single person on this planet has melanin. Every single person. Let me tell you this again. <laughs> you will not be alive if you didn't have melanin. The only difference in melanin is the color. Um, it may offend some people to find out that there's black, uh, dark, dark matter in the universe that doesn't interact with melanin. Dark energy doesn't interact with it. I mean, these are my opinions. That's what I, these are my personal opinions. I don't want to offend anybody who believes that. Um, I truly do believe that um, everybody is created with a specific purpose and a specific skill. Different races, people have different uh, skills that they do have. It's, it's well known, well seen. Uh, and we're all part of a big puzzle. We're all pieces of a puzzle that come together. But I don't think that, um, I think it's been taken a little bit out of context. Just my personal opinion that. Melanin has some kind of special superiority over other people that have light melanin. Everybody's got melanin. 
Some people's melanin are dark, some people's melanin are yellow, some people's melanin are more uh, white. Uh, it's the way it is. How do we get that? It wasn't because my African brothers and sisters were hanging out in the sun and they turned black. What happened was, if you read the Emerald Tablets, after the Great Flood happened, and Thoth was sent to the land of Kem, the land of the black people, to teach them how to rebuild and kickstart their civilization, he then turns his crew, after they raised them back to a high level, and he tells them to spread around the world and duplicate what we've done here. Those people who are his crew spread out all over the planet, <coughs> kickstarted civilizations in different regions, and those people that they were ruling over, and they became those people's gods in some cases, even. They put a genetic marker on those people. They genetically modified them. They put a stamp. It's like you put a stamp on a cow, a seal on a cow. These are my cows, my farm. So they, black people were here already, but they stamped Asians, they stamped uh, you know, indigenous people and various red people, the red man, the Caucasian man out of the Caucasus Mountains. Some of that's talked about the Sumerian tablets. Uh, they actually came much later on, to be honest with you. Uh, and when they got to the Caucasus Mountains, they then genetically modified the Caucasian. Uh, however, there's, so there's a 2% variance in genetic material in every <coughs> single race. And you, to get that, it would take a couple of hundred million years to naturally occur. It had only occurred in 200,000 years. So biologists and scientists are saying, and geneticists are saying, this had to be artificially done. But they can't say who did it. They can't figure out who could have possibly done this or how. But they do have a date 200,000 years ago. When did the Anunnaki say that they genetically modified people? 200,000 years ago. Ancient tablets matching up with modern science. Once again, I love it. So, you know, it's a pretty interesting story, but I think that some people, in my opinion, have kind of gone too far with it to the point where they're making up, they're, they're claiming that theories are fact. And I don't like to do that. I don't like to claim that theories are fact. Because once you start doing that, now you're trying to say that this is a fact, and if I say this, you should believe it. Now you're going to go duplicate it, duplicate it, duplicate it, but there's no factual evidence to back it up. And that's the same thing as going to church and listening to a pastor, in my personal opinion. You must just go to church and take what the pastor does. So I like to find science to back up things. Not that all science is correct, but I do. I try to, to, to the best of my ability, to find out as much as I possibly can. I've been reading, you know, biology and stuff like that, encyclopedias from a very young age, and learning about, you know people and genetics and everything else. And uh, now, of course, they control the narrative because they write the books. So there's a certain amount of information that's always going to be skewed. You have to use discernment. But when you start looking and talking, even like I've done to uh, African-American geneticists and doctors that support the black community, and they're telling me, you know, it's been taken a little bit out of context. Uh, Black people are just as powerful and mighty and intelligent as white people, and white people are just as powerful and mighty as black people and Asian people and indigenous natives and Mayans and everything else. Everybody has the power in them. If they didn't, I wouldn't even be doing this class. I wouldn't even invite other races of people to come here. It would be a waste of your time if you didn't, if you didn't have the same capabilities as me. So we all have the power inside of us. We're all energetic beings. We all are extremely um, powerful people. And we all are just a small piece of the puzzle. I'm a piece of a puzzle, you're a piece of a puzzle, you're a piece of a puzzle, you're a piece of a puzzle, and together we made the whole picture. Now that's the part we've got to identify. What piece am I? Where do I fit in this cog, in this wheel? Where, where, where do I fit? And when you find that you fit into that spot, the picture starts to become more and more clear. And when, uh, when that happens and 7.5 billion people wake up and realize that in truth, we all are really just one race, the human race. And all of this divide and conquer tactic and all of these weird, crazy claims that come out are designed to give a person a superiority complex. You can be confident and you can be just as strong and powerful and will-minded without having to take on somebody else's opinion and theory about something that has never been proven, especially right now in genetics. You can just go online and you can get the information and find out that everybody's pretty much identical. Just the color of the melanin is different. So, you, 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 you know, in my opinion, we've got we've to gotta find a way to cross those barriers. And we've got to understand that, um, you know, the longer that we build in these superiority complexes in our mind, the longer it's going to take for us to 
achieved a level, higher level of consciousness. And it doesn't mean that you can't be proud of your race. It does not mean that. I'm extremely proud to be a black man. This is my second, third time around. Hey, I'm black this time. I'm, and I'm a man. <laughs> I'm happy. Okay, I'm, I'm extremely happy. I got a lot, of, a lot of opportunity here that you know some people don't have because I have opportunity to make changes and be a, and be a part of those changes and be a part of part of history. To me, that's exciting. Uh, and so I can support my race. I can be just as proud of my race, and I can expose injustices. I can expose inequality. I can expose police brutality. All these things, and be proud of who I am. But at the same time, I can support the whole world at the same time. That's where there's a falling off sometimes when you get to superiority complexes. You then disconnect from other people. And I think that's not what's really truthfully intended, especially if you read the Emerald Tablets. It's about ascension of consciousness. And to do that, you realize consciousness is what we learned yesterday, a light wave. And light waves that we can't see with our own eyes, and I'm pretty sure those light waves don't have any melanin in them. Sorry, it's photonic energy, electro electromagnetic waves. So we have to understand that everything is coming from thought and then manifesting and that these avatar bodies are just artificial biological machines that are endued and empowered with a certain amount of divine energy that we can access through our light being. We can activate that and we can utilize that. Every single person has the same exact power, period, in my personal opinion. Could I be wrong about this? I could be. It's a possibility. It's up to you and your own discernment what resonates with you. What I say today may never change your mind. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. All information isn't for everyone. I'm just saying, look at it a little closer. Dig into it a little bit deeper. Research genetics a little bit more. And come up with your own conclusions. So here you have this, which is actually a cymatic frequency. The cymatic frequency is being broadcast from the top of that tripod down to this table, the stone table. Then you see this gentleman right here. He's lifting this stone table with one hand. So this Anunnaki God that you see, this big guy, you can tell how big he is by his size, obviously he's sitting down, he's still taller than the average human. He's uh, teaching human beings to, how to levitate. The people behind the guy lifting the table are whistling. They have their hands in and up like this, so they're, they're whistling. Uh, he's got this field amplifier in his hand, and this is work that I did with an actual electrician. He's sitting on a magnetic device. You can tell that it's a magnetic, potentially a magnetic device because of the positions of these two lines on it, which signify uh, the polar fields. And if you go to um, uh, the Coral Castle in Miami, you find these same exact things at Coral Castle. They have these tools and so forth there, which is really amazing. The only thing that's missing now is the black box, which is on video when you look at the video, but somebody ran off with the black box. Somebody stole it. I guess probably a tourist who went there one day, you know, because the tools are within hands distance. You can reach over and just touch something. Somebody probably grabbed it and ran off with it. But you see the cymatic frequency at the bottom. This frequency is the exact frequency. I think it's 936 hertz. Oh, no, it's 1332 hertz is what it is. 1332, I believe it is, or 1334. Uh, is this frequency, but this is the frequency that creates anti-gravity. <laughs>